بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم ادای مبروت نماز کمپشنت نماز مرسفو الحمد لله رب العالمین پریزیز be to the Lord of the worlds and salute to our Prophet Muhammad and his pure household and progeny. Felicitations to all the respected viewers, uh, the Iranian nation, and the entire great Islamic community, the occasion of the, the auspicious occasion of the birth anniversary of the great uh, prophet of Islam, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and also the auspicious birth anniversary of uh, Imam Jafar Sada. This is a great Muslim festivity and uh, it uh, just laid the groundwork for the appointment to prophethood of uh, the prophet. That's the greatest uh, and epical history-making point for humanity ever. So hopefully this uh, festivity and Eid occasion uh, will be a great and a, and a blessing to all Islamic community, the Iranian nation, also for uh, human community, it would be a source of multitudes of blessings. Well, today we have three occasions concurrently, one being the uh, auspicious birth anniversary of the Prophet, the Prophet of endeared Prophet of Islam and his grandson, Imam Jafar Sada. We have another occasion, <coughs> the beginning of the Unity Week, which is also of paramount importance. We also have the 13th of Aban, Iranian calendar that falls on November 3rd. That's the day of fighting the global arrogance. Now, regarding each of these, I will make a few points and comments addressing the Iranian nation. As for the great <coughs> prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, there are uh, many Quranic verses, <coughs> some of them uh, very clearly um, uh, deal with uh, and has to do with uh, what's happening in the world today now. But as if uh, when you're reading those verses, it's as if uh, they those verses have been revealed to the Prophet for mankind living at this time and age. One of them is this verse in the Bara'at chapter that says in Arabic, we appointed a respected person from among yourselves who is kind to and compassionate to the faithful and believers. The first uh, <clears throat> two statements of the verse uh, addresses the entire human community. And in the following verse, it says, uh, oh, people, I'm a prophet uh, descended upon you. That's the, the entire humanity that's being addressed by prophet of Islam. So these two statements are really important. That means the person who is respected, the person who, uh, who the suffering of human being uh, costs the prophet dearly. So he suffers from your suffering. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> he is compassionate. He is <clears throat> kind to you. He is keen on your <clears throat> destiny, a good destiny for you. This is, uh, again, uh, this has to do with the entire humanity. So today, <clears throat> the human community is actually being addressed by this Quranic verse. I mean, this, has, this is directly proportionate with the status quo of human society these days. Human being today, you can say that uh, more than any other time in history, humanity is undergoing 
uh, immense suffering. You can see inequality, you see warmongering, uh, and extremist materialism, and this has been uh, unprecedented uh, to this extent. I mean, this kind of material inclination among human society, it's that intensely. You seldom seen that the use of uh, science and technology in order to repress the people, rebel, re rebellion, and treachery, all of these, you have inequality, discrimination, uh, injustice, uh, this always existed in the course of history, it doesn't belong to today, but <clears throat> these days they're using the lovers of science and technology in order to <clears throat> exercise this <clears throat> satanic power. The pharaoh, for instance, would say that uh, in, within the realm of uh, Egypt, he would do whatever wrong he wanted to do. But today, America, that's the <clears throat> very same pharaoh of today. Uh, they did not suffice to America only. They do not say that. Mm -hmm. I'm ruling you and I do what I want to do to you. They go to other countries, they start wars there, they uh, try to wield hegemony there, they make bases there. So that's what the situation is like. By making use and taking advantage of human um, knowledge and science, and uh, this is what uh, the global <clears throat> arrogant powers are doing, warmongering, you see, is happening more than any other time. So the prophet of Islam, as the Quran says, <clears throat> his pure soul and spirit mm, suffers from this human suffering. And that mm, he wants to see mm, prosperity of humanity, he wants to see humanity guided the right way. <clears throat> well, the uh, Prophet was uh, <clears throat> a kind uh, uh, father par excellence, he wants to see humanity moving on the right path, and uh, he wants to see humanity <clears throat> attain the right destiny. Now, one point in this Quranic verse, <clears throat> this is a de this appears at the end of the Barah chapter. And Barah chapter is a chapter of war. It means uh, <clears throat> deliverance from uh, infidels and pagans that that uh, enjoins you <clears throat> to join the battles and fight the infidels at the end of the chapter it says uh, as i told you that it addresses the whole nation the entire public so there's a lesson and point that could be drawn from this and that's the mm, uh, uh, this is uh, related to masses of, uh, it's, it's not non-Muslim actually, masses and crowds. This also relates to the leaders and rulers of the arrogance and pagans. Now, those uh, <clears throat> establishments that rule the destiny of human society, the Quran calls them uh, leaders uh, of uh, infidels. Well, that's what the Quran says in Arabic, that uh, they are leading the people toward uh, the hell and inferno. That's what they're doing, those leaders and rulers. So that intensity that the Quran <clears throat> in the face of uh, <clears throat> pagans and infidels, that, that's what's expressing about these people. So the masses of uh, non-believers and infidels, those who, and actually those who are following justice, those who have no antagonism <clears throat> and no ill wishes, they are those who are being addressed by that <clears throat> graceful statement that who says prophet suffers from your suffering. Now, today, the enemy of the Islam, the, the main enemies, are those leaders who invite the people to hell. These are the global arrogance and the world Zionism. These are the ones that are actually fighting and confronting Islam with full force. So the last <clears throat> demonstration of this antagonism was what you saw happen in Paris last week, unfortunately. That was a horrible uh, 
uh, performance in Paris that should be contemplated upon. Well, there was this caricature. Well, a caricaturist uh, uh, did something wrong, and then they uh, cursed uh, the Prophet of Islam in the language of drawing uh, uh, a caricature. Well, it doesn't mean that an artist uh, has gone awry and has done something wrong. That's not only this point. It's, it's not confined to this. It's not behind this. There are some uh, hands and gloves. And what's the reason for this? The reason is that you all of a sudden see that in defense of this uh, let's say something, some normal artwork. A president, for instance, a head of a government, stands by that, and some other governments uh, go for its support. That means there are people behind this. It just merely doesn't mean that this is an art uh, of France that has uh, 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 faced decadence and reached this point. It means it's policy. It's the establishment that's backing and advocating this wrong deed. So the political figure goes there and expressly uh, announces his advocacy for this. Well, you are saying that this man has killed uh, a person. So, okay, for for the victim, you can, uh, you can sympathize with the victim, you can feel uh, s sorrow and regret. So why do you get these caricatures posted everywhere and installed somewhere? and uh, you assert your open support for that. This is a bitter incident. It's, uh, it's a horrible thing that's happening at the level of a government. It just does not mean that there, there was only an artist or a caricature who did this. That's not all about it. Last time when the same thing happened, uh, we saw the same story, the same saga. Again, there were some uh, political figures and personalities uh, who came to the fore and they supported that move. Of course, this is the Islamic, the Islamic community is uh, enraged and they're opposing. This shows the vibrant Islamic community that they're aware that they're uh, across the Islamic spectrum, the Islamic world, the people, uh, politicians and scholars, many of them, of course, some of them, again, have shown how humiliated they are, how mean they are. Of course, the majority of Muslims and Muslim scholars and politicians, they have defended the Islamic identity, the uh, prophet of Islam, and they have expressed their uh, outrage. This shows that uh, the, the people are awake. And, but there is a lesson to be drawn, and this is part of the uh, points that we uh, should be heeded by those who have to do with politics in the world. So the French government here uh, relates this to human rights and to different kinds of freedoms and so on and so forth. This is where you should uh, contemplate and learn. Now, what kind of a government is the French government? What kind of policy is that policy? This is the very same policy that is the fiercest, that is the most savage and brutal terrorists of the world have been harbored. France is where uh, the terrorists, uh, those kind of terrorists, are, have uh, sought shelter. Those who assassinated our president, our prime minister, the head of judiciary in Iran, they are the very same terrorists. And there are lots of uh, members of parliament, members of the judiciary, uh, and also on top of 17,000 people on the streets, that's based on the statistics that we have available. People in the street, but they uh, martyred them all. These are not average terrorists. And where do they harbor? France, Paris. And these people are talking about human rights and freedoms. Now, the very same government, well, uh, when it comes to Saddam, like a, a ferocious wolf, we can call him, he. This government offered him the greatest assistance during the uh, Saddam imposed war. You cannot say it was a greater assistance compared to other foreign countries, but one of the largest contributors to the Saddam war against Iran was France, advanced weaponry, advanced uh, fighter jets, and military hardware. That was what France provided uh, that uh, ferocious wolf with. And they, they, and they simply acknowledged that they had done the same thing. 
they were they didn't feel embarrassed about it. So that's how they dealt with terrorists. And regarding their own people, the way they behave toward the middle, you see on Saturdays, you remember the past one year, they haven't said. You, you saw what uh, the way they behaved uh, as compassionate, the most merciful. Praises be to the Lord of the worlds and salute to our Prophet Muhammad and his pure household and progeny. Felicitations to all the respected viewers, uh, the Iranian nation, and the entire great Islamic community. The occasion of the the auspicious occasion of the birth anniversary of the great uh, Prophet of Islam, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and also the auspicious birth anniversary of uh, Imam Jafar Sada. This is a great Muslim festivity, and uh, it uh, just laid the groundwork for the Appointment to prophethood of uh, the prophet, that's the greatest uh, and epical history-making point for humanity ever. So hopefully this uh, festivity and Eid occasion uh, will be a great and a, and a blessing to all Islamic community, the Iranian nation, also for uh, human community, it would be a source of multitudes of blessings. Well, today we have <clears throat> three occasions concurrently, one being the uh, auspicious birth anniversary of the Prophet, the Prophet of, endeared Prophet of Islam and his grandson, Imam Jafar Sada. We have another occasion, <clears throat> the beginning of the Unity Week, which is also of paramount importance. We also have uh, the 13th of Aban, Iranian calendar, that falls on November 3rd. That's the day <clears throat> of fighting the global arrogance. Now, regarding each of these, I will make a <clears throat> few points and comments addressing the Iranian nation. As for the great <clears throat> prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, there are uh, many Quranic verses, <clears throat> some of them uh, very clearly um, uh, deal with uh, and has to do with uh, what's happening in the world today now. But as if uh, when you're reading those verses, it's as if uh, they those verses have been revealed to the Prophet for mankind living at this time and age. One of them is this verse in the Bara'at chapter that says in Arabic, we appointed a, a respected person from among yourselves who is kind to and compassionate to the faithful and believers. The first uh, <clears throat> two statements of the verse uh, addresses the entire human community. And in the following verse, it says, uh, oh, people, I'm a prophet. Uh, descended upon you. That's the, the entire humanity that's being addressed by Prophet of Islam. So these two statements are really important. That means the person who is respected, the person who, uh, who the suffering of human being uh, costs the Prophet dearly. So he suffers from your suffering. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> he is compassionate. He is <clears throat> kind to you, is keen on your <clears throat> destiny, a good destiny for you. This is, uh, again, uh, this has to do with the entire humanity. So today, <clears throat> the human community is actually 
being addressed by this Quranic verse. I mean, this has this is directly proportionate with the status quo of human society these days. Human being today, you can say that uh, more than any other time in history, humanity is undergoing uh, immense suffering. You can see inequality, you see warmongering, uh, and extremist materialism, and this has been uh, unprecedented uh, to this extent. I mean, this kind of material inclination among human society is that intensely. You seldom seen that the use of uh, science and technology in order to repress the people, rebel, re rebellion, and treachery, all of these, you have inequality, discrimination, uh, injustice, uh, this always existed in the course of history, it doesn't belong to today, but <clears throat> these days they're using the lovers of science and technology in order to <clears throat> exercise this <clears throat> satanic power. The pharaoh, for instance, would say that in, within the realm of uh, Egypt, he would do whatever wrong he wanted to do. But today, America, that's the <clears throat> very same pharaoh of today. Uh, they did not suffice to America only. They do not say that. Mm -hmm. I'm ruling you and I do what I want to do to you. They go to other countries, they start wars there, they uh, try to wield hegemony there, they make bases there. So that's what the situation is like. By making use and taking advantage of human um, knowledge and science, and uh, this is what uh, the global <clears throat> arrogant powers are doing, warmongering, you see, is happening more than any other time. So the prophet of Islam, as the Quran says, so, <clears throat> his pure soul and spirit mm, suffers from this human suffering. And that mm, he wants to see mm, prosperity of humanity, he wants to see humanity guided the right way. <clears throat> well, the uh, Prophet was uh, <clears throat> a kind uh, uh, father par excellence, he wants to see humanity moving on the right path, and uh, he wants to see humanity <clears throat> attain the right destiny. Now, one point in this Quranic verse, <clears throat> this is a de this appears at the end of the Barah chapter. Barah chapter is a chapter of war. It means uh, <clears throat> deliverance from uh, infidels and pagans that that uh, enjoins you <clears throat> to join the battles and fight the infidels at the end of the chapter it says uh, as i told you that it addresses the whole nation the entire public so there's a lesson and point that could be drawn from this and that's the mm, uh, uh, this is uh, related to masses of, uh, it's, it's not non-Muslim actually, masses and crowds, it also relates to the leaders and rulers of the arrogance and pagans. Now those uh, <clears throat> establishments that rule the destiny of human society, the Quran calls them uh, leaders uh, of uh, infidels. Well, that's what the Quran says in Arabic, that uh, they are leading the people toward uh, the hell and inferno. That's what they're doing, those leaders and rulers. So that intensity that the Quran <clears throat> in the face of uh, <clears throat> pagans and infidels, that, that's what's expressing about these people. So the masses of uh, non-believers and infidels, those who, and actually those who are following justice, those who have no antagonism <clears throat> and no ill wishes, they are those who are being addressed by that <clears throat> graceful statement that who says prophet suffers from your suffering. Now, today, the enemy of the Islam, the, the main enemies, are those leaders who invite the people to hell. These are the global arrogance and the world Zionism. These are the ones that are actually fighting and confronting Islam. 
with full force. So the last <clears throat> demonstration of this antagonism was what you saw happen in Paris last week, unfortunately. That was a horrible uh, uh, performance in Paris that should be contemplated upon. Well, there was this caricature. Well, a caricaturist uh, uh, did something wrong, and then they uh, cursed uh, the Prophet of Islam in the language of drawing uh, uh, a caricature. Well, it doesn't mean that an artist uh, has gone awry and has done something wrong. That's not only this point. It's, it's not confined to this. It's not behind this. There are some uh, hands and gloves. And what's the reason for this? The reason is that you all of a sudden see that in defense of this, uh, let's say something, some normal artwork, a president, for instance, a head of a government stands by that. And some other governments uh, go for its support. That means there are people behind this. It just merely doesn't mean that this is an art uh, of France that has uh, 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 faced decadence and reached this point. It means it's policy. It's the establishment that's backing and advocating this wrong deed. So the political figure goes there and expressly uh, announces his advocacy for this. Well, you are saying that this man has killed uh, a person. So, okay, for for the victim, you can uh, you can sympathize with the victim. You can feel uh, s sorrow and regret. So, why do you get these caricatures posted everywhere and installed somewhere, and uh, you assert your open support for that? This is a bitter incident. It's. Uh, this is a horrible thing that's happening at the level of a government. This just does not mean that there, there was only an artist or a caricature who did this. That's not all about it. Last time when the same thing happened, uh, we saw the same story, the same saga. Again, there were some uh, political figures and personalities uh, who came to the fore, and they supported that move. Of course, this is the Islamic the Islamic community is uh, enraged and they're opposing. This shows the vibrant Islamic community that they're aware that they're uh, across the Islamic spectrum, the Islamic world, the people, uh, politicians and scholars, many of them, of course, some of them, again, have shown how humiliated they are, how mean they are. Of course, the majority of Muslims and Muslim scholars and politicians, they have defended the Islamic identity, the uh, prophet of Islam, and they have expressed their uh, outrage. This shows that uh, the, the people are awake. And, but there is a lesson to be drawn, and this is part of the uh, points that we uh, should be heeded by those who have to do with politics in the world. So the French government here uh, relates this to human rights and to different kinds of freedoms and so on and so forth. This is where you should uh, contemplate and learn. Now, what kind of a government is the French government? What kind of policy is that policy? This is the very same policy that is the fiercest, that is the most savage and brutal terrorists of the world have been harbored. France is where uh, the terrorists, uh, those kind of terrorists, are, have uh, sought shelter. Those who assassinated our president, our prime minister, the head of judiciary in Iran, they are the very same terrorists. And there are lots of uh, members of parliament, members of judiciary, uh, and also on top of 17,000 people in the streets, that's based on the statistics that we have available. People in the street, that they, they uh, martyred them all. These are not average terrorists. And where do they harbor? France, Paris. And these people are talking about human rights and freedoms. Now, the very same government, well, uh, when it comes to Saddam, like uh, 
a ferocious wolf, we can call him. He, this government offered him the greatest assistance during the uh, Saddam imposed war. You cannot say it was a greater assistance compared to other foreign countries, but one of the largest contributors to the Saddam war against Iran was France, advanced weaponry, advanced uh, fighter jets and military hardware. That was what France provided uh, that uh, ferocious wolf with. And they, they, and they simply acknowledged that they had done the same thing. They, were, they didn't feel embarrassed about it. So that's how they dealt with terrorists and regarding their own people, the way they behave toward the world. You see on Saturdays, you remember the past one year, they have been, you, you saw what the way they behaved toward their own people and the way they dealt with Yalavez protests on Saturdays. And then they claim uh, of human rights and freedom. So I'm uh, of the belief that they are uh, two sides of the same coin. I mean, defending savagery, cultural savagery, and then, I mean, that uh, criminal uh, act committed by terrorists, defending such a deed is one side. The other side of the coin is defending for uh, terrorists and uh, <clears throat> dictators like Saddam Hussein. They are two sides of the same coin. Well, in European countries and in America, the same thing uh, has happened. I mean, insulting the Quran, insulting the Prophet of Islam. Several times the same thing has happened in different points in the West, and in America and in Europe, that has been repeated. But these cannot actually hurt and dent the dignity and magnanimity of the Islamic Prophet in, in any way, in the slightest way. This is pretty apparent that the enlightened face of the prophet of the fiction is not dent in any way. He, his face will shine even more brilliantly like the, uh, those uh, uh, hooligans and hoodlums in uh, Mecca at the time of the Prophet of Islam. They tried their best, but they could not uh, conceal the reputation of the Prophet of Islam. So this, the same thing is being repeated. History is being repeated. These people these days they cannot do anything about it. I mean, they cannot do anything. They cannot harm the Prophet of Islam in any way. But there is only one point that we should uh, notice, and that this is an indication of the nature, the brutal nature of the Western civilization. This indicates the fact that this civilization, this culture, inherently, it has, this is modern ignorance, actually, uh, that uh, has to do with oppression and savagery and brutality. Of course, uh, they hide this savagery, they conceal it because science, knowledge, and technology, they, they, they make they avail of that. So uh, they cover that up by technology and by knowledge, and they cover savagery underneath that cover. And they talk, they, they wear this uh, uh, human face, and they use, they, they wear perfumes, you know, they wear ties, and they try to appear neatly, and they dress up the nines, but yeah, they try to cover those savagery and brutality underneath all this this facade. Well, the, the Prophet of Islam is not, his reputation is not dented in any way. This is only a way for us to get to, to, to better get to know this culture, which is really a brutal one, a savage one. This, this is uh, what has beset their own nation after several centuries, since the beginning of this, the advent of this civilization, since the Renaissance, I mean. You see what the situation is like, inequality, poverty, uh, you see injustice, you see the embarrassing uh, moral decadence that you see in corruption in Europe and in, in, uh, in America and the followers, you can see what's happening there. This is the nature, this is inherent in this civilization. So let's go to the second point, and the Unity Week. Well, I believe that today, more than any other time, the significance of this great initiative of the late Imam Khomeini is being uh, evident to us. And the day uh, when the late Imam Khomeini designated the Week of Unity, and uh, he stressed uh, the unity among uh, Islamic uh, denominations in their <clears throat> uh, uh, directions and their social and cultural 
uh, standpoints that that day, lots of those uh, people who were addressed by this message, at that time, they could not feel how significant this message was. We can make a mention of uh, some of the <clears throat> leaders of Islamic countries. They did not comprehend how important uh, the message was. Many people did not comprehend this, they did, not, they did not get the message. Many of them um, just had some ill wishes and they did not, they just simply wanted to ignore it. So today we just come to realize <clears throat> how significant that message has been, the, what's happened today. All these different kinds of um, <clears throat> divisions and differences that you see among Muslim countries, these are uh, horrible instances, uh, incidents that has happened in some countries like in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Yemen, in Afghanistan. Now what's happened in these countries, uh, when you look at those uh, incidents, you see uh, how significant uh, unity was among the Islamic uh, countries and how valuable uh, a blessing that has been. That's what the late Imam Khomeini asked for. Uh, if unity had existed, lots of these, uh, what happened, uh, would not happen today. With so many things that's happening in this, besetting the Muslim world, especially part of the Muslim community in this world, what's happening is catastrophic, partly. The issue of Palestine, the cause of Palestine was faded away. The treacherous move, the humiliating move uh, of normalizing relations with the Zionists, that, that was launched. Well, all of these are the, the, the reason behind all of this is the, the lack of unity among the Muslim uh, countries. You know, you know, there is this rivalry among them. They have erroneous uh, incentives for their decisions so and they made such a wrong decision and they plundered they actually and they trample upon the palestinians rights of course this is not going to to come to an i mean they cannot uh, they're too mean to be able to put an end to the cause of palestine the cause of palestine will persist will go on palestine will be palestine the zionist regime fabricated zionism will uh, go away, no doubt about it. But they are simply making obstructions in the way to the best of their ability. So this relation with the killer and usurper regime, the Zionist regime, the criminal regime, they have usurped the land, they have killed the people. How many Palestinians, you see, they have killed and how many sorts of different crimes they have committed. They establish relations with such a regime and they are pleased and they are proud of this and they simply come up with some justifications for doing so. So the point I want to make is that this initiative, unfortunately, a number, many Muslim countries and many uh, audience, they did not uh, understand how significant that was, but the enemy did so. I mean, the, the enemy realized that this recommendation of the late Imam Khomeini, that's unity among Islamic denominations in their policies and strategies. They can keep their own faith, their own ideologies, whatever way they believe in, they can have their own rituals, their own special way. But when it comes to overall, let's say, posturing and stances, unity, how important that is for the Muslim community and how the enemy influence would be mitigated that way. That's what the enemy uh, recognized and realized, and that's why they tried to plan against this. And they came up with some schemes, with some practical uh, schemes that the enemy came up with in order to confront the message of unity of the late Imam Khomeini. Well, like uh, creating centers for uh, production of uh, some thoughts that that would be divisive. You know, we're talking about proximity of Islamic denominations. We're talking about such a thing. They they came up with some centers. They paid some mercenaries and they employed them there so that they could uh, pr produce some thoughts and content in order to uh, come up with ideas against this proximity. 
and togetherness. So they wanted to uh, act in such a way that this great prudence and wisdom of the late Imam Khomeini would be nullified. So they had think tanks uh, acting against this, and they created takfiri groups uh, like this, the Daesh uh, terrorist criminal group. And this is what the enemies of Islam uh, created. Americans themselves confess. If we had made a claim, of course, you know, we had some information, we were informed, but if we had informed that they would uh, cast it out, but, but that they themselves uh, came up with a confession. I mean, uh, the peop those in the uh, administration, when the when Daesh was created, they confessed, and also later on, the next administration, this person who is now at the helm of the White House, he expresses said that they themselves have created and have given rise to Daesh and they supported the mercenaries in the region, the government, uh, the, the cronies in the region, they were paid, they bought them weapons and they gave them different kinds of facilities and possibilities. So, <clears throat> they uh, created think tanks, they also created terrorist groups and elements, and also uh, those elements who did not know, actually didn't want to actually enter this game, they caught them by surprise, and unknowingly those also got involved and they were enraged and they made them, they set them off against one another. I mean, all of a sudden you see that in a, a certain country in our neighborhood, a, a scholar goes to the podium and then insults the other denomination, and then he goes to the British embassy and takes shelter there. I mean, this is what's happened just recently. And such a thing, we have so many instances like this. So they force the people to uh, enrage the people and to set the people off against and put them off against one another and create division. Well, they asserted that they have done that themselves. The, the point I want to make is that a number of uh, governments in this region that are in charge of monetary support, they have committed bigger sin than those uh, groups that have joined them. I mean, people who from a corner of the Muslim community, they have their own, uh, maybe out of ignorance or bias, uh, they have joined the terrorist group. They have committed a smaller sin than the person, than the ruler or authority or the king in that state who pays them money and who equips them with military hardware and weaponry. Of course, the main <coughs> crime uh, is uh, attributed to the Americans. In uh, Takfiri, for example, uh, operations, uh, uh, the main crime is uh, should be attributed to Americans. Uh, of course, there were some others, the Saudis also, they paid them and they supported them. In addition to committing this crime, the Americans also committed another crime, and that is that under the pretext of their presence in the region, they took uh, soldiers to different their army all the way to Afghanistan. Uh, they uh, deployed forces to Syria and uh, other parts of the world. Some other countries also, they have been trying to deploy forces there, like Iraq, for instance. Of course, Iraqi youths will not allow that to happen because they have their own rightful uh, decision that, that will prevent Americans from infiltrating there. But that's the scheme that they have in their mind, and they, they want also to uh, find a, a footstep there. Uh, whatever they went, they took with them instability and destruction. You can see in these countries, the infrastructure was uh, destroyed, civil war was created, insecurity was perpetuated. You know, they engaged uh, uh, the governments and the states in different things so that they would not be able to do their main jobs. So this is the really, they <clears throat> destroyed the, the whole generation. So in our opinion, the unity week is really of the essence, and Muslim unity is the cure to many ailments of the, and ills of the Islamic Muslim community. And that this uh, catastrophic uh, Yemen war that you see, it's been 
five years they have been uh, attacking this innocent uh, people. They're killing them in, in, in bazaars and at schools, at homes, and in public places. They are being bombarded. And the, the, this is not a trivial thing. This, this is this is a significant thing. You know, Saudis have been really acting brutally in Yemen or the issue of Palestine. I mean, you have a number of. Uh, mean and humiliated states uh, that they have turned their back uh, and they made a mockery of the Islamic community and they uh, actually in their own whims and wishes they ignored the cause of Palestine and they stood by the side of the Akbar and the criminal on the back of unity of Muslim community all of this would be addressed without a shadow of doubt the problems and issues of Muslim states and Muslim nations. There are lots of, you know, multitudes of problems from Kashmir as far as Libya, where you see problems everywhere. So hopefully, on the back of Muslim unity, all of these issues could be addressed. Okay, and that was the second issue, the unity week. Now, as for the 13th of uh, Aban or November 3rd, interestingly, 13th of Aban, that's the day of fighting the global arrogance, is concurrent with the birth anniversary of Prophet of Islam. And we have this uh, Quranic verse that uh, Muhammad is the messenger of God, and whoever is with him, they are uh, kind among themselves, and, and they are harsh against uh, their enemies. This is what you see this great move uh, <clears throat> by our views. And the 13th of Aban, or November 3rd, is <clears throat> the day, the manifestation of the fight <clears throat> against global arrogance by the Iranians. It was not only an issue of a simple, uh, an embassy thing, it was a great thing that was done, <clears throat> a symbolic move uh, in the <clears throat> fight against global arrogance. Now, the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> establishment is, is an arrogant one, is, a, is an imperialist one, and uh, it's a source of lots of uh, treachery, lots of evil. That's what it's warmongering, it's terrorist, it nurtures terrorists, it's interventionist, it's corrupt, it's uh, seeking monopoly. This is when we talk about global arrogance and imperial, this, this all these ills uh, you, you could envision uh, the, within it. So, of battling such a thing, such a phenomenon, uh, is exactly tantamount to being wise. Well, some people say, no, this is unwise, this is not sagacious. That's not true. This is exactly the wise thing to do. I mean, surrendering to and bowing down to um, is actually unwise. And we, we never initiated things. I mean, uh, the, the Quran also uh, mentions the same thing exactly, and it says they started it after the Islamic Revolution in Iran. They had we didn't attack the embassy. I mean the the U.S. embassy was there when the revolution happened. They were doing their job, but they started taking making moves against the Islamic establishment both inside the U.S. They had resolution after resolution, speech after speech, and Congress. They took measures against the Islamic Republic. That was a nascent establishment. They made decisions against this nascent establishment. They had this terrorist groups <clears throat> launched against us. <clears throat> they had <clears throat> coup d'etat mongers created against us. Inside the U.S. Embassy, <clears throat> that was the, you know, the, the right uh, name was chosen for that, the den of espionage. They, they were embarking on great spying activity, they started all of this, and so when they started this, it was then our students moved that they stormed the embassy, and that was in defense, that was the timely one, that was the right one, and it was based on wisdom. Let me also mention this fact that 
<clears throat> Some people would, what they have, their assumption of the U.S. Uh, establishment is a wrong one. They believe that if such a government uh, surrenders to that regime, then they will benefit from that. No, that's not the case. I mean, these people that you see in the world, that these governments that they have to do with the U.S. and that they are a little better off, and that's because they did, did they did not surrender i mean the more relations you have and the more interference the us has in that country they will be harmed but those who have surrendered to the to the, to the americans they have uh, accepted and adopted us policies and they accept the humiliation of ex, uh, of being under the us influence and thumb they have been harmed like camp david is an ex instance we have uh, also an instance of the, the Pahlavi regime in our own country. Uh, the country was really moving backward by surrendering to American policies. Of course, day after day, those uh, regimes will become more dependent. Now, as for the U.S., our policy is a well-calculated one. And this policy does not change with people being replaced, taking power. Well, today we have the elections in the U.S. Now, some people are talking about what's going to happen if this uh, person or that person uh, comes to power. Well, things may happen. Well, yes, but it has nothing to do with us. I mean, it will not impact our policies. We have our own clear-cut and well-calculated policies, and it doesn't make any difference who takes office. I mean, but we need to look at their own situation. You see, you know, it's really interesting to watch the president, the incumbent president, and he is going to hold the election. He's in charge of holding the election, actually. And he is saying that this is the most fraudulent election in the U.S. history. Who's saying this? The very same president who is in charge, and he is actually holding the elections. And he's saying that you see the greatest extent of fraud in U.S. history. And then the, the, his rival says in return that Trump wants to, to embark on extensive fraud. And this is, this is U.S. democracy. That's the style of U.S. democracy. I mean, they themselves, that's how they, how they comment about their own elections. And this shows the ugly face of liberal democracy within American society. Now, regardless of who is going to be elected, now this one or that one could be voted for, it will be clear today. Now, one thing is certain, and that's the political, moral, and social decadence of the U.S., no matter who is elected. Well, well the American regime is beset with political and uh, civil decadence, and a moral one also. This is not an interpretation. This is not an interpretation. This is what they themselves are confessing to. This is what they are uttering. These are their, their own uh, speakers, their own writers and authors and spokespeople, their own think tanks inside America. These are the comments that they are making. In the past years, they have written a number of books, and they have sold out in the U.S. <clears throat> some of those uh, books, you know, they, they reveal some facts. So one of those uh, books that was translated into Farsi, I just read that one, it's replete with all signs of this decadence that I'm in. I mean, if you read that book, the, from the very beginning to the very end, it shows, the whole thing that it shows is the decadence of the U.S. establishment, I mean, the moves that the U.S. president has taken and the, his actions. This, this empire will not last long. I mean, when they come to this point, when politics of, when, when the regime reaches this point, they will not last so long, they're on their last legs. Of course, some of them uh, will uh, make the U.S. feel that destruction maybe sooner, some of them later. But that's the fact. 
Well, their animosity against us is because that we do not accept and surrender to their recognize their uh, dominance because we did not gave up to them because we did not accept their policies in the region, the policies toward Palestine. That's what we rejected. <clears throat> their brutal policies we did not accept. That's why uh, they're antagonistic. And this will go on. This antagonism will persist. And the only way to remove this antagonism is that we do something to disappoint them. I mean, we should, uh, the Iranian people, the government of Iran should do things in such a way, we should come to the point to disappoint the other side. And they should be discouraged from uh, dealing a heavy blow. We need to strengthen ourselves. I've repeatedly told our people and also officials in the meetings that we have working meetings or private meetings that I have had with the authorities. I have mentioned this point that <clears throat> what's needed is that the <clears throat> real power, true power, is what we need to strengthen within ourselves. People should be stronger than the enemy <clears throat> will be despaired. Of course, the people have uh, pulled up great resistance, stiff resistance, really. Uh, you know, we had the sanctions problems and its uh, <clears throat> impacts and ramifications. The people have really withstood all these problems. People have been really resilient. And so in three areas, uh, the officials need to make uh, more moves and better moves in the economy, security and culture. In these uh, three fields, we need to augment uh, I mean, the authorities need to augment their efforts and activity. Now, when it comes to e economy, I mean, we should have the right the right look the, the, is that we shouldn't have our eyes cast upon outside of Iran. It doesn't mean that we sever relations, no. When I say that you should find the cure and treatment inside, some people um, on social media start uh, speaking about this and say that we should sever our relations with the outside world. No, that's not what I'm saying. We should have our relations ongoing, but what is that we shouldn't seek the treatment and the cure from outside of our own society. We should find it inside the country. That's what we should try to do. And the main thing is to boost production that I've stressed on numerous occasions. We need to have this uh, well-planned and well-organized uh, drive in the field of economy. There are so many <clears throat> problems that we're facing these days. They have nothing to do with sanctions. They have to do with our own uh, a lack of coordination among this high prices recently. No justification for that, the high prices. Uh, to a large extent, some of them cannot be justified. They need to be addressed. They have to be addressed, and the officials need to act in coordination. And you see that uh, you have high prices. You have in, uh, beef and you have the price of chicken, tomatoes, all the way to uh, diapers, you know. So high prices w can be seen without any good reason for this. I mean, no justification for that. And do you have all those goods and commodities out on the market, on the shelves. Everything is available there. I mean, if the Ministry of uh, the relevant uh, ministries and government bodies, uh, uh, some other organizations uh, who have to deal with these and customs and others, they need to join hands, they need to cooperate, and they need to tackle the problem. All of these could be addressed and controlled. So on the back of a coordinated management and coordination among different uh, government bodies, the problems could be addressed. Now as for security, uh, when we're talking about, of course, foreign uh, security, the country needs to be equipped with defense capabilities. You see drones, uh, fighter jets, and, and uh, missiles. That's what we're engaged in. This brings you security. <clears throat> it causes the country not to be targeted by the enemy. The, the enemy will never feel <clears throat> uh, 
feel like uh, attacking or evading the country if you're strong. Well, no, you cannot address all the problems by making missiles. And some of the problems have to do with, have nothing to do with uh, missile building. But many of the problems have to do with these very same defensive equipment. As for <clears throat> uh, internal domestic security, our intelligence apparatus should be vigilant and careful about infiltration of the enemy and, and their penetration into different bodies. <clears throat> That's the main problem that they should be careful about and cautious. So, culturally speaking, also cultural authorities need to uh, make attempts, and they should be wise attempts. You know, sometimes we may have, we may do a lot of cultural work, but they should be smart. They, we, we gotta know what to do in what area, which activity suits best in what environment. If we do act like that, then I believe these are three categories, economy, security, and culture, these are the basic uh, fields on the back of vigilance, coordination, and cooperation. Hopefully, the things should be addressed. Officials are uh, uh, working. They need to act more seriously. And the last point being regarding this war that's happening in our neighborhood, unfortunately, between two neighbors, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, this is a bitter incident, I mean, it threatens regional security. It's not good for our country either. So as soon as possible, it should come to an end. Of course, uh, uh, territories of Azerbaijan that have been occupied by Armenia, they need to be liberated. All those lands should go back and return to Azerbaijan Republic. That's the main condition. Well, that land belongs to Azerbaijan, the Republic of Azerbaijan, and to liberate uh, those lands, Azerbaijan is entitled. They need those lands need to go back to Azerbaijan. Of course, the Armenians who are residing in those uh, territories, they need to be provided with security. International border should also be <clears throat> respected. I mean, the two sides should respect the borders of countries. No aggression should be made against them. So international frontiers should also be there. And terrorists should not be stationed near our borders, as we have in our reports. Of course, some people are denying this, but we have reports that are reliable that a number of terrorists from here and there have pitched in. If they are close to borders, if we feel threatened, we will act accordingly. Definitely will act decisively, so they shouldn't approach our borders. Hopefully, uh, all Muslim nations and the nations in the region and human uh, society, uh, the entire human society, will get rid of all these problems and issues and then dear respective people of Iran on the back of this auspicious birth occasion in the pure soul of the late Imam, the uh, Imam Sadiq, and the pure soul of Prophet of Islam. Hopefully, we will be <clears throat> awaiting bright days in the near future. Hopefully, this future is around the corner. And that's the end of this speech.